when you think of healthcare today, healthcare is fundamentally a labor-based business, right? And so why do healthcare costs go up every year? Easy, it's because we just throw more and more humans at the problem, and that doesn't seem very scalable. So what we want to do uh, at Ford is we want to basically take as much of healthcare as possible from the, from the labor cost curve to the technology cost curve, right? Mm -hmm. So the first iPhone was 800 bucks. Now everybody uh, around the planet has smartphones. Why? Because you know, technology follows that curve known as Moore's Law. And so things like our body scanner may seem expensive today, but just give it time. Those things are coming down every single day. Right. So all we're trying to do is infuse as much technology as possible. So this gets in, you, you talk about the labor, you know, the, the cost of labor. And Seth, this is very much, uh, a, a, you know, you want to do two things. One, you want to create jobs that people want to do, right? right. Yep. Um, and you want to, uh, and if you're going to scale and cross all the way to Connecticut, you're going to have to hire a lot of human beings at a decent wage. That's right. You're also uh, investing in them. They're W-2 employees. That's right. yep. they're, they're not, this is not a sharing on demand situation. You want these to be good jobs that people, that have living wages, right? So, That's right. Um, how do you, and of course, everything is about the doctor and the, the caregivers in your model. How are you guys thinking about that when it seems like the narrative of Silicon Valley is, well, aren't, aren't robots taking all the jobs, yep. right? Um, so the level of inefficiency in our particular industry today is pretty shocking. Um, and when you look at what the average agency charges a customer, they're marking up the labor rate by 50%, right? So it's so inefficient that there's too much cost for the elderly and not enough going to the care pros. And so what Honor is initially doing is we're charging the same rates that the existing industry charges, but we're taking more of that 50% and we're putting it to the care pros, both in the form of higher hourly rates and also better benefits and even equity. Right. And so we need, so one part is how you pay. The other part is as you get more density, you can get the care pros to not have to drive 40 minutes to a home, but 30 minutes, 20 minutes, and then eventually you get to the point where a care like pro... like the Uber-like liquidity that you're looking liquidity for. Liquidity is really important, right? Uh -huh. And this is why a fractured system, right, where no one owns more than 0.1% of the market is terrible for the care pros, right? Because they have to drive all over the place and they're going to the homes that they're not appropriate for because their agency got the call. Their agency has only 30 people, but none of those 30 people are really great for that customer, right. and that actually puts the care pros in a bad spot. So the more liquidity you have, the bigger your market, the more efficient you can be. And that, if done right, creates a much better world for the care pros. And you're right, I mean, we're spinning up something called the Honor University, because right now we um, interview the care pros, we're accepting between 5 and 10%, depending on how great a job we're doing targeting, right, and finding the care pros. <laughs> That's not enough. Uh, so creating something like on a university to create jobs, right? Like if the rest of tech, if some of tech, not all of it, but if some of tech is taking jobs away, I think this is actually an area where tech can help create more, better jobs. These are jobs that are about human-to-human -human relationships, That's right? Right. The same with yours. You're, we're talking about you know people who've been through medical school and you know have I would assume a lot of options, but the GP, the the, the sort of the family doctor. That's been in decline in our society for some time now. So how does this change yeah, so, if your model takes hold? So Seth's, Seth's business is in many ways entirely different than ours from this perspective, where what we're, what we're suffering from in, in kind of, uh, as you see with doctors, is exactly what you're referring to, which is there's not enough doctors given the amount of people that need health care. Um, and then if you go beyond kind of our, our myopic circle in the United States and say, actually, let's just look internationally, the amount of underserved uh, folks out there is, is pretty, pretty absurdly high. So we don't think of it as uh, we want to compress the amount of doctors. In fact, it's the total opposite. We just want a doctor to be able to touch more and more lives by getting them out of the inefficiencies. So a simple thing is a doctor can't follow you home today, right? They can't kind of really keep an eye on all of your behaviors. They can't tell you what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. But sensors can, right? But even when you come into, the, uh, come into our location, Think of it that, uh, and there's a great study on this from a couple years ago, that doctors today spend about 40 to 50% of their time not seeing patients, but just kind of interacting with technology, right? 
putting together all the records so they can bill, et cetera. Well, if I can take that 50% of their time and I can give it back to another set of patients and say, now you can touch more lives, right. then it's a win-win. If I can make it so that the, that same doctor can watch over you know, 500 or 1,000 people while they're at home, while they're out there exercising, that's a win for everybody. Mm -hmm. So again, this is why over time, as we create more efficiencies, all we're doing is reducing costs and getting healthcare to more people. I'm curious. Um you guys both, uh, you know, you're multiple entrepreneurs, you know, both have backgrounds at Google. Um, you know, there are probably a lot of people who are saying, oh, here come the tech bros trying to, you know, reinvent an industry. Stay out of our industry. We, you don't understand it. This is never going to work. Um, first of all, you run into that, and, and, and how do you answer it? Yeah. Um, so, yes, definitely. Uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, what you need to be good at is knowing what you are good at and knowing what you're terrible at. And so I had no background in healthcare. I had no background in labor. So the first senior person we hired was this woman, Phaedra Ellis Lampkins, who was the youngest CEO of an AFL-CIO area. Um, and she did that for the first 13 years of her career. Um, so we immediately went and got very senior people who understood labor and then who understood healthcare and home care. And we brought them in and we said, hey, with your knowledge and our knowledge on how to use technology, how can we fuse these two things to make a better system? And what is interesting is we ran into a problem where we kind of had the labor and care side of the house building one company and the tech side of the house building a different company because they are really different ways of thinking. And so then we said, okay, we're gonna take one of our founders, Sandy, uh, my co-founder from my last company as well, and she became literally the bridge. She was the tech person who was completely embedded with the care team and then stayed with them, went to every meeting and started to figure out, okay, how can our technology really help make these people better, more efficient to deliver better care? Mm. Yeah, so we did something uh, in many ways very similar. So uh, our company is about 12 months old and uh, 90 days into starting the company, um, we actually had a fully functioning doctor's office. We still have it. It's uh, in a warehouse not far from here. And the reason we did it is because we didn't think we actually knew what we should build. We thought that we could figure it out with doctors and with patients. And so every single one of our design teams, you know, oftentimes people come up to us and they say, wow, which one of your designers came up with that screen or came up with that body scanner? And then I just point them to the doctor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I say, actually, the doctors came up with it. We kind of, you know, threw something at the wall and said, try using it. And they said, oh, I get what you're trying to do. This is disastrous. Let's rebuild it. And so we iterated inside of our kind of prototype doctor's office every single day, changing things, changing things. Um, and, you know, nine months later, this is kind of uh, what you see today. Yeah, I, I, last question, because we were, we're short on time. But, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs who've done other kinds of companies, you know, software-based companies, these are not, these, these are real world hard problems. The funding mechanism of Silicon Valley, for the most part, has optimized in the last five to 10 years, I guess you could say on Instagram, <laughs> right? Like, you know, let's find a way to build an app, and you guys have apps, but build an app that, that when it tips, man, it goes boom, and we get, we get the deck of corn, right? Are you worried about, you know, getting two, three, you guys are well-funded for your first couple of years, you've got that squared away, but what happens when you need the next couple hundred million dollars? Is, is the Valley ready to give that to you? Are you concerned about a funding desert? Yeah, um, so when I invest in companies, right, one, the number of one thing that I actually look for is does it have very substantial network effects? Because what's happening with those consumer companies, which are just kind of all pixels, right, and not mm -hmm. real world stuff, is as they get a little bit bigger and bigger, they hit a tipping point where their network effect kicks in and then they get really big really fast. And so Honor very intentionally is a company with a lot of network effect because if we have 10 times more care pros than the next company, we will always have the better care pro for your mother, right? And so we have confidence that with scale, we'll hit that same kind of tipping point that the traditional internet companies do, but this time applied into the real world. And I think the other thing that Silicon Valley is looking for is big outcomes, right? And so when you're, if you're an entrepreneur, second time entrepreneur like both of us, 
you know that if you're gonna do a real world company, it's gotta be an existing market, right? That is massive, where if you really fix a fundamental core problem that people have, you're looking at a multi-billion dollar, hundred billion dollar style outcome. Yeah, I, obviously I agree heavily with, uh, with Seth or we wouldn't be friends, but I wanna, <laughs> add, I wanna add another element here, which is people often get super caught up on the, on the notion of, well, did you raise two million or did you raise you know, 30 or 50 million? When you look at the outcomes of, of many brick and mortar companies, they actually have extremely large, very similar size outcomes. You're right that it often took more capital to get there in, uh, in the beginning. But to some extent, who cares? If I show you a $10 billion company, do you care if it costs you $2 million or $15 million to get in in that first round? And there is a set of, uh, of investors, I think we're both lucky to, to uh, be backed by, the, by some of them, that, that absolutely see that the, those economics work and are much, uh, much more uh, appreciative of the long time frames that it, it takes to get there. But on a risk reward basis, I would actually argue that the outcomes are fantastic in many of these companies. Well, I wish you both very well, and cool. thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Adrian, Adrian. Jeff, thank you, man.